Just slightly jumping around, but how did you end up training, you know, world champion bodybuilder training uh, a boxer? How, yeah. How, I've, I've not well, heard that before. <laughs> it's amazing. We used to, we would train sometime, would see each other in the same gym, you know, because I lived in a place called uh, Fayetteville in college, near College Park, Georgia. And Evander lived there also. And uh, we would often see each other and became, you know, friends and associates. And his uh, manager called me and said, well, Lee, we love what you got, which what I had, they love, as he explained it, the energy, the fact that I was Mr. Olympia. I had a track record of winning and knowing how to win. I understood the science of nutrition, all those different things of training. And so they said, we want to have you on our team. We want you to work with Evander and create a, a program to help get him from cruiserweight to heavyweight, but at the same time, keep him explosive and, uh, and maintain his endurance level and build upon that. And, and so I began working on that. And one of the people that I got involved in doing so was Dr. Fred Hatfield. I'm sure you're familiar with Dr. Squat. Yeah, I don't, yeah, Fred, as you know, he squatted over a thousand pounds to set a world record at the age of forty-six. 46. You don't squat a thousand pounds when <laughs> you're forty-six years old, and he didn't look like it. I looked like I could squat a thousand pounds. Fred looked like Elmer Fudd, you know, little tank, little big belly, and you know, bald headed. This guy can't lift any weight. But Fred was a scientist, one of the uh, foremost recognized sports scientists in in the world. And I said, Fred, listen, bodybuilding, I understand. Uh, sports science, uh, a little bit different. So me and Fred got together, and he helped me massage the program, helped create it, to create, you know, bring in plyo, plyometrics into the training, ballistic weight training, everything to stimulate fast twitch fiber without using 8 million pounds, which will also enhance his speed and explosive power. So we put all of that together. We got Evander from 192 up to 212, 214 pounds in five weeks. Faster, stronger, all of that. And we had Miss Betty wearing 275 that cooked his food for us. <laughs> <laughs> so it can be done and have an understanding. And with those understanding, I spent countless hours with Dr. Hatfield, which, you know, God rest his soul, he passed uh, a year or so ago. Oh, really? Yes. And uh, when he was there in California, you know, overseeing uh, Muscle and Fitness Magazine at <clears throat> Weeder Center. So we spent a lot of time together, man, just talking and going over different things. And, and uh, he gave me a lot of insight on how to go about stimulating muscle growth without using 8 million pounds and ripping your joints apart. Right. Now, as a result of that, you know, at the age of 58, I have no knee, hip, back, or shoulder problems because I understand the science. You know, which is why also I started what is called the International Association of Fitness Science. It is a certification program that teaches correct training, the right training system, how to match the different body parts, understanding of nutrition, how to blend that in. Uh, so we have two different functions there. One is ultimate bodybuilding, that's bodybuilding science, what we did here at Mr. Olympia. But then you also have functional training which is an age management type of training, which helps to uh, helps to sort of massage training programs suitable for your age and suitable to where you are and who you are, which is extremely important to setting up training programs. Yeah, and I know you're you've, you've got it on on the book, <clears throat> um, exercise to stimulate, not annihilate, and being mm -hmm. in the industry, obviously at the moment the trends really kind of you know, go out, go all out, just beast mode, destroy yourself. Um, but we all, you know, I'm 48 this year. Um, mm -hmm. We, we want to look, we, we want a good body, we want muscle. Right. Um, what's your approach to that? Do you, do you have to, if, you know, if you want to have a good, and you, you've had the best physique in the world, mm -hmm. you know, if you want to build muscle, can you still do that without sort of destroying your body? Oh, yes, yes, <clears throat> I'm, I'm living proof of it, not only me, but you have people like Ed Corny, you have Arnold, you have Franco Colombo. You see none of these guys, particularly like Franco, he lifted a ton of weight, but he understands systems. That's what I love so much about the science of our sport. Particularly, people use the term old school and new school. Well, in old school, we never got hurt. 
we're still walking around without injuries and without surgeries. The younger school, they tear their knees, hips, back. They rip themselves apart. They tear triceps, all kinds of craziness mm -hmm. because of trying to lift the world. See, I always use that example. In 1984, I weighed uh, 243 pounds when I won my first Mr. Olympia. In 1991, I weighed 254 pounds. So that's, a, that's about 10 pounds over an eight-year period. So we look at muscle maturity, balance, growth over a period of time. We, don't, we didn't rush our physiques. We made them better, looking for different angles as far as training, using a type of weight that will allow the body to grow and recover at the same time. I, I've always used a term that is, is better to undertrain than to overtrain. Really? And that's where you see a lot of what, what's happening now. A lot of injuries are taking place. You know, there's training systems now where <clears throat> Some of the athletes are training one body part a day. Well, if you're training a body part for an hour, you're overtraining. Now, I generally, even when I train for the Mr. Olympia, I spent no more than maybe uh, two hours or an hour, 45 minutes in the gym. That's split into two training sessions. You know, so, uh, but that was being, that was training once every fourth, uh, fifth day. Right. With so what, what three was your body parts when you do it? Do well, it? I would mix push-pull. Push meaning chest, pull meaning biceps. That would be, for, for example, that would be Monday. Then, of course, uh, uh, abs and calves with that. Tuesday would be legs, paws, and hams. Wednesday would be back, push, shoulders. Uh, well, back, pull, shoulders, push, calves, abs. The fourth day would be off. Right. Then I begin the cycle again. So the three on off one was the best training program. There was enough training frequency to develop quality for the physique. At the same time, enough time to recover for the next workout. Right. Uh, now you see guys that are training one body part a day. And as you see, the physique is not as complete as they were during that era. You see guys with much smaller calves, you can't train your calves. I talked to a lot of guys at the show, you know, you, you meet them, say, okay, let me take a look at his calves. So that's always an indication of how far you're gonna go. And so, well, I gotta work on a little bit. How many days are you training? Once or twice? I said, you can't train your calves once or twice. It's a stubborn muscle. It's been walking around with you ever since you were a kid. You gotta give your calves at least around four to five days of training a week in order to stimulate it because it's been walking with you ever since you were a toddler. So just a regular whole home workout is not going to get it. So these are kind of programs we see out there's kind of systems that's all messed up. And they're using too much weight and they're doing, giving too much uh, stress to a particular muscle group at a long period of time. As far as in the gym, like an hour, it doesn't make sense. Right, right. Yeah. And, and with, with your, were you using <coughs> machines or were you using a lot of traditional squat, bench? I use a lot of traditional, uh, a lot of traditional. I've used machines for like uh, definition, separation, you know, like leg extensions. I'd use a machine on that, leg curls, use a machine on that. But for all mass building movements, uh, I would either use the bar or dumbbells. Right. The bar or dumbbells. You can't, can't get better than those. You know, there's a lot of machines out there today, but when you notice most of the machines, when it comes to chess or that sort of thing, uh, uh, they are uh, a little bit different because when you're training, you want to make sure the body mechanics are aligned with what you're doing. If they're not, then you can get injured. I, I recall at one time doing an incline chest press because the bench was, was full, the incline was full, and I used a machine. I had only 25 pounds on each side. And I went up to do an incline, and I felt a tweak in my shoulder because the machine was taking me in the direction it wanted to go. So I could naturally make the adjustment as my body felt free in doing so. So that's my problem with machines. They predetermine where, where the muscle should go, whereby if you have free weight, 
you can make your adjustments. Well, I'll scoot down a little lower, I'll bring it up a little higher, or I would bring my arms out a little further or in a little closer. So all of those things are very important. That's why, you know, and again, the free weights are, are far better. Right. And you, you mentioned that about the weight. You don't right. use crazy weights, and, and, I, and, and you said even now you, you do that to protect your body. Going back then, and I guess there's lots of people that would striving to have that type of physique that you had what what sort of weight were you lifting like you obviously did go heavy i'm, I'm guessing but how did you manage yes that? heavy for me would never allow me to drop below four or five reps see five reps was heavy two reps was too heavy right and of course i maxed out on the <clears throat> bench press and did 500 pounds just one time just wanted to know if i could do it you know and that was it but i never did it again I've always, I would always stay around where I can at least knock out in off season when I'm developing strength, at least six to eight reps. I never go below that because I'm getting into powerlifting at that point. Well, I'm not a powerlifter. My deal is to get as much quality and use good form and good technique for longevity right. and over <clears> a <throat> period of time, give quality to the muscle. So four, four to five reps um, was really, you know, any lower than that, and it's like... It's power lift. Drop, drop it. Okay. Your joints, sooner or later, your joints are going to tell on you when you're doing that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And even as you get older, I guess, for, particularly for guys, you know, our testosterone drops, we want to maintain muscle yeah. mass. Would those similar principles apply then? Well, as you get older, you want to lighten the weight. Definitely. I mean, I can go in the gym and try to make my, you know, chest lift a 100-pound dumbbell, but, but why? And I'm no longer competing, you know, so I just want to feel good. I want to keep that muscle belly nice and healthy. I still want to have a good look. So generally, I would go around 50-pound dumbbells now and doing a flat dumbbell press. I don't do bench anymore because bench was necessary, but not totally necessary for bodybuilding. But a bench is not really correct. You're here when you're pushing. That is not correct. A dumbbell is correct for you here, coming here. So it's a lot easier on the shoulders. You have guys who always got shoulder problems from doing a lot of benching. Right. So, uh, but then again, in the sport, we were a little bit crazy. We do stuff that don't make sense, like behind the neck presses. We do all kinds of stuff. But we have to know how to, how to change gears with that. I wouldn't always bench press. Sometimes I would do flat dumbbell presses. You know, and maybe uh, the next workout, I'll do bench presses. But benching, I would generally stay around uh, 315, maybe 365. She'll get my, uh, my six to eight reps in. Mm -hmm. That was good. And what about speed? I know now you, know, you see a lot about people sort of you know, really controlling the speed, really dropping the weight. Was that something as well you were doing? So some very slow reps? While I've never doing... done slow reps. Okay. Never, never. It was always doing the negative that people get injured or tear their pecs. Really? I would control the weight, control instead of slow. Coming down on the bench, you come here, then you explode at the bottom. Like, I call it check mark, come check. Check, ease out. Check, ease out. Check, ease out. But never, never, ever. Okay. Because it's crazy. If you're going to bend down, you wouldn't bend down slow in slow motion. You would bend down, then you come up. Because as long as you, there's something bad going to happen when you go against the mechanics of what's natural for the body. That's interesting. You know, you got guys do, you know, curls and they're coming down real slow. It's a negative. You're not going to get any growth from a negative. All you're doing is putting stress on your ligaments and tendons. They weren't made for that. Right. It was always doing the exertion where you stimulate fast twitch fiber and growth. Right. And again, as you're with your aging as, as you get older those those are still the same type still of the training. same still the same nothing changed nothing has changed about my training it's just uh, the amount of weight that I do is not as much the volume changed a little you know I'll go in the gym now I do a f flat press incline press then I would do a dip an assisted dip <laughs> <laughs> I let the young cats do the other stuff so I would do a dip, and then next work I'd go in and do steel flat, steel incline, because these are the basic fundamentals, flat, incline. Then I'd do a, a dumbbell fly, mm -hmm. you know, for quality. See, dips is quality, and it hits the lower pack, and you have your dumbbell fly for quality, which 
dumbbell fly may go up to about 40 pounds. You know, come a nice squeeze, nice and slow and controlled. Right. And what about you still squatting? Oh, yeah. I still squat. Right. I've used, I do, I use a pre-exhaust. See, and a pre-exhaust is, this is very important, particularly for those who will be looking and, and listening. If you can get your leg to think that you're using 8 million pounds and you're only using 500 or 300, then that's great because the leg doesn't recognize how much weight you're using. It only recognizes the feel. And if it feels heavy, then the response is going to be growth. So with a pre-exhaust, leg extensions, leg presses, squats number three, guess what? You don't have to use 8 million pounds. That saves your knees, your hips, and your back. <laughs> so you fool your leg into thinking you're using 400 pounds, you're only using 200. So I still use that same training principle. I have no knee problems, no joint, none of that. And I still have nice, nice development to my legs. And as we get older, we have to continue yeah. to do leg presses and squats because your legs will be the first thing to go. And I don't want to look like I'm riding on the turbo. No. <laughs> That's, it's interesting. I, we interviewed Frank Zane as well, and his same approach was, I want to be injury free. And, yeah. and it seems right. that, you know, I think it's an important message because the industry is going into that kind of, you know, beat yourself down, come out of the gym crawling. And, and, and I, I certainly, you know, I've had back injuries, shoulder injuries, knee injuries. And, and it's interesting with that message for someone who's sort of been through mm -hmm. that whole sort of, spectrum of working out and still looking good. How, how old are you? I'm 58. 58. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> I hope I look that good when I'm 58. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I think it's a, it's a great message to say, look, you know, if, you, if, you, if you're smart, you can still have the physique you want. That's right. A, an amazing physique, but you don't have to destroy your body for when you're older. And I think exactly. that's really important. That's, that's what you want to shoot for. Stimulate, don't annihilate. Yeah.